Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program. It's my great privilege to introduce to you men and women who, because of their great love for Christ, or sometimes other journeys, are brought home to the church, uh, sometimes in the process, finding Jesus in the process. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But our guest tonight is a former guest, uh, because this is Open Line First Monday. We reserve this first program of the month to try and give you more opportunities to call in uh, and to ask your questions by email. And so I invite back a former guest. Our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Ben Weicker. He's, uh, well, I guess the nice way of saying a former Methodist. I'll let you describe it in, <laughs> in a bit, Ben. But your questions are essential to the program. So even now you can start calling with 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can give me a call at 205-271-2980 or you can send us an email at journeyhome, one word, at EWTN.com. Ben, welcome back Glad to, to be the back. Journey Home. Glad to be back. That beard's looking great. Uh, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm graying it as I, I'm aging it. That's because you're that professorial writer type living out in the, in the Walden a, Pond out yeah. in the country, <laughs> right? It's purely natural. <laughs> no Grecian formula. Well, it looks great. I, I always, uh, my wife likes me to grow a beard, especially this time of year, but Every time I try to, I'll get an email from somebody that says, don't do it. So uh, I stay clean shaven for the program. But it's great to have you back. Great to be here. What we do on, the, on this open line program uh, is we encourage our viewers to send questions and emails in relationship to what you're going to talk. But we prime the pump by asking you to give them a bit of a short reminder of your journey that you gave last time on the program. Well, uh, I guess the best way to say it is uh, that my, uh, my wife had the direct route and I had the woefully indirect route to conversion uh she uh we went to different colleges together so we were we were separated by a i don't know how many hundreds of miles and uh, oddly enough she had all catholic friends or many of them catholic and she would go to mass with them well she felt the uh, uh the the presence of christ when she would go in uh and uh, uh and that really had a remarkable mm -hmm. effect on her Meanwhile, I was down somewhere at, an, at another college, and I was having a much slower uh, intellectual conversion. And, and I would not have known, uh, I did not know where it was going to end up. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it ended up where she got to right away. So, so mm -hmm. she went in the front door, and, and I went in the, the back door eventually. Uh, and, and I actually only found out later that, um, that she would have converted much earlier. But uh, she... Uh, she knew that I was not there yet. You know, I, I, had to, I had to have, I had to be pounded into the right place intellectually. <laughs> You're enlisted as a, a, a former Methodist. We toyed with calling you a mushy Christian. Uh, that might be more accurate. I, I don't want the mushy Christians to call in and be offended, but um, <laughs> yeah, to, to say that we were Methodist is only to say that we passed through the Methodist Church uh, in. I think we went to for about a year when I, when, when I was down at Vanderbilt, and uh, we, we threw ourselves into it. That, would really, that was really our first, uh, for, for both of us, our first, what would you call it, the full church experience, mm -hmm. you know, because we didn't really have that kind of background. Neither of us came from strong Christian backgrounds or strong Protestant backgrounds. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that was our first um, bid with organized religion. Let's mm -hmm. throw ourselves into it. And we did throw ourselves into it. Uh, full force, and then we gradually found out that we were in the wrong place. Hmm. Uh, although there were many wonderful things about it, um, it didn't have, for her obviously, didn't have the presence of Christ. I mean, actual yeah. Christ. Uh, there's a person in this church that she felt. And as wonderful as the Methodists were, they're not sacramental. Hmm. And, uh, and then I felt that the, the sort of the intellectual theological foundation wasn't there. Um, but there were also uh, other problems as well, and so we ended up happily walking into the church together. We don't have one of those unpleasant drama where one comes in and one doesn't. We just we went right through RCI together and came in together. What was for you the the main drawing card 
Uh, was it something that you had mainly left behind that aimed you to the Catholic Church, or was there something about the Catholic faith that drew you to it? It's, it's hard to explain. It, you know, um, well, I wasn't trying to become a Catholic at all, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I'm not to blame for that. Uh, but I kept, I was studying, say, the history of philosophy and the history of science and the history of political philosophy, and I kept ending up backing into the Catholic Church. That is, I would come to some Catholic theologian or philosopher and say, oh, well, this is right. And, and, and then quickly run somewhere else <laughs> because you could feel the, feel the walls <laughs> of the cathedral closing in on you. Uh, but, you know, and, and it just didn't occur to me until, you know, finally so many things fell in place that I felt, okay, well, you're outside the door. There's nowhere else you can go. You've gone through the history of philosophy. You've ended up here. You've gone through the history of science. You've ended up here. You've gone through the history of theology. You've gone through the history of history. Where else can you go? Okay, so, so happily my wife didn't have to wait any longer than that. Now did you, did you ever get close to actually being a card-carrying atheist in that process? No, um, but although... Because I know you were, you, were, you were trying to fight against it, yeah, fight against uh, the church. Going yeah, that way. It, it just wasn't, I, I just had no notion that that's where I would end, not even an inkling uh, yeah. where I would end up, but, but never an atheist. Um, that, I never found that attractive, and early on I found enough arguments against it from the various disciplines, uh, you know, from whatever direction, you know, I'll be studying the history of science, the history of philosophy, and you know, atheism just isn't tenable, yeah. intellectually tenable, so I was never attracted to it, but on the positive side, I found, well, the, 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 the whole Catholic presentation is the best um, antidote hmm. to the kinds of things that lead people to atheism. So it, in that way, fighting against atheism, you know, seeing it, well, this is the wrong way to go, brought me backwards into the church. All right. Well, a couple things just to prime the pump for you, callers and emails. Uh, uh, Ben's written books on uh, pro-life. You were on here uh, yeah. the first time uh, here at EWTN talking about, what's your first book that you? That, well, the first book I did was Moral Darwinism, which is a, is, is a history of ethics and science and how that has all culminated uh, in a view uh, that I call moral Darwinism, that is, uh, in, in an attempt to explain human nature entirely from an evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. and the pernicious effects that that has. And then I did a book called The Architects of the Culture of Death, looking at a lot of the chief architects uh, who have uh, defined our culture. I did that with Don DeMarco. All right. And um, you've been on the EWTN talking about yes that. Yes, I have. Yes, I You're have. also even, even as we speak this week here to do a bookmark with Doug Keck on your newest book, A Meaningful World, How the Arts and Sciences Reveal the Gene Genus of Nature. Yes, indeed. Talk about that. Well, that what I'm trying to do in that is show how it is the various disciplines provide convincing, converging evidence for the existence of God. And by that I mean everything from literature to mathematics to the history of chemistry uh, to uh, the, the history of science, uh, a larger perspective, physics, biology, all lead you to affirm a creator God. Now this, all this is, is the Catholic Church's position in regard to uh, a natural theology. That is, we can demonstrate the existence of God from his effects in nature. And I wrote, co-wrote this with a, a, a wonderful man, Jonathan Witt, uh, and it's, it's our uh, attempt to show how the latest science actually leads you to God, the gene, whom we call the genius of nature. Hmm. Your story, your, your own pilgrimage um, in itself argues against what so many people believe out there, that if you study science deeply, you'll end up an atheist. If you science history deeply, or if you focus on math, or you focus on philosophy, that you end up... And What's fascinating, though, is the rise of atheism today, mm -hmm. even when the information is there to fight against it. And I don't know if it, it might be true of some of our viewers. I personally can't imagine ever buying into atheism. Um, I suppose even in my darkest days when I, you know, I just lost hope, you know, I'm going through some depression and... and uh, um, I, my guess is some people out there can't imagine that me, a living saint, would go through the, just ask my wife, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but even in the darkest moments of despair, feeling the idea of, of abandoning the faith in, in our cr loving Creator and Father, I can't imagine it. 
But yet there's a, this rise today on popular level books that, as you said, uh, you wish your books sold so well in the sense that they are gaining a popularity. Why is that? It's a, it's a long story, uh, to, but to make a, a long story short, uh, the, their atheists now uh, are making a bid. And I'm talking about people like Richard Dawkins, uh, now in America, Sam Harris. They're selling a lot of books. I'm talking about number two and three and four on Amazon. You know, New York Times bestseller looks very popular um, and popularly formed arguments f for atheism against Christianity. Now, of course, atheism has existed way back into ancient Greece. Right. Uh, it, it arose again with a, a real uh, flair and fervency uh, four or five hundred years ago and has been gaining speed since then. That's the origin of modern secularization. And uh, this challenge has been around, but, but it's making its way now really to what you can call pop atheism. That is, it's not, you know, just in the university corridors anymore. It's out there on the New York mm -hmm. Times bestseller list. So, Is it driven by the sexual revolution? It, it, or is it just I driven by you know the idea that I don't want anybody looking over my shoulder or believing that I think that's part of it. I yeah. think that is you know in other words, I think people realize that if you want to live a certain way, you've got to have a universe to support it. You know, in other words, the universe has to support what I desire to do. We can't take that disjunction between how the universe is and how I want to live. And uh, part of modernity, and this again goes back three, four hundred years, is desire to have a universe which frees our desires from having somebody look over our shoulders. So that's part of it. But another part of it, and it, it is allied with this, is the, uh, the rise of a kind of materialism in, in science. It's a constriction of science, as the Pope recently said in his Regenberg addresses, it's a constriction of reason, a constriction of science, a reduction of it. And that reduction of science and rationality that forms the model of scientific materialism does lead to atheism. So if you study science like that and you study uh, uh, philosophy like that, well, you can very well be led to atheism. You can very, be, because uh, as I argue elsewhere, it was designed to do that. It makes atheists. It's like an atheist intellectual machine. You come in one side believing, you come out the other side not believing. Um, as you approach the faith, from a study of history, mm -hmm. history of science, history of philosophy. Uh, talk about your, your jump from that into believing in the real presence, believing in the miraculous, or as you're studying science, mm -hmm. how do you fit in the supernatural reality of what we believe as Catholics? I don't see a, con a contradiction, but you had to still make the jump at some point in your own journey. Well. Um as I said, you know, my, my, my wife jumped right into that. You know, she, she felt the presence of Christ in the church. I had to climb through a lot of hedges to get there. <laughs> but one thing that I realized is you, you've got to have what's called a realist understanding of nature. That is, that stuff really is out there and you can know it hmm. to form the foundation of the sacramental life of the church. Okay, so this, you know, things are real. <laughs> you have access to them, you can know them. Uh, th that forms the foundation of a sacramental view of reality where God can mediate truths to you both through the sacraments mm -hmm. and through sacramentals. Okay, so uh, I realized early on that all the bad views were anti ultimately anti-sacramental and anti-realist at the same time. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, bad philosophy always turns against the Eucharist but it also turns against reality. And when I saw the two coming together, I thought, you know, oh my God, really, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you really must be present there because you are the arch realist, right? And there's nothing more real than the Eucharist. You know, it's not a, it's not a fiction, it's not a mere symbol. Uh, this is the living God. So uh, I saw the connection through, um, through, through seeing the right view of reality. You know, as uh, essential to Catholic uh, uh, teaching is that grace builds on nature, mm. okay? and and that really it was seeing the kind of view of the view of nature upon which grace must build that brought me to grace. Isn't that the wrong way to do it? I don't know, but that's how it ended up. <laughs>
Well, we've primed the pump for our viewers. A lot of heavy stuff here, philosophy and ethics, and uh, and uh, are, are viewing the, uh, the world from a, a real perspective. I think about the scientists that want to argue that this table really isn't here because it's all made up of atoms, which are all mostly space. Yes. And so we human beings are nothing more than space. That's right. These little yeah. orbits of everything. And that leads to eventually a belief that nothing is real. That's true, it, it, it does. And uh, it's this, the very solidity of reality is what, what does Jesus say when he comes back? Well, touch my wounds. Well, have some fish. You know, okay, he's not a solipsist. He, he, you know, the suffering is real, God is real, human beings are real. And so the reductionist view of nature that tries to look at you as simply, oh, you're not real, you're just a, 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 a large mass of atoms. Uh, that view is, is w uh, what we take on primarily with this, uh, a, a meaningful world. And what the Pope recently uh, spoke okay. against in, in these Regenberg's talk, he is an incredible philosopher mm. of science. The more I read on Benedict, I think this man is a genius. I mean, I think he's a saint, but he's also a genius. All right, let's, uh, again, that's a meaningful world, and I think you can go, uh, if it isn't up yet, it will be on the religious catalog, EDWTN, in case you're interested in finding out about that book by uh, Dr. Weicker. Let's go to our first caller, Jerry from Arizona. Hello, Jerry, what's your question for us? Yes, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. I really love your program. Thanks, Jerry. I'm a cradle Catholic. Uh, my wife passed away in August of cancer. And uh, I'm going to some bereavement classes. Yeah. The counselor is a doctor. He's a Methodist minister. He's very compassionate, very good. And I will talk to him about redemptive suffering or suffering. Yeah. Now, I've cheated a little because I did uh, Father Spitzer's uh, uh, lesson on oh. suffering and the God of love. Doesn't get much better than that. That's good, yes. And, but in my pain and whatnot, there are words. And I'm trying to bring those words of that study by Father Spitzer to reality. And I'll talk to uh, this Methodist minister, and he doesn't really add to it. I don't know if I'm offending him. He doesn't oppose it. But I was just wondering where Methodists stand on suffering. All right. Great question, That's Jerry. interesting. Well, having passed through the Methodist Church, um, <laughs> you don't, you, in, in Protestant churches generally, you aren't going to see an emphasis on the crucifix. You're going to see the bare cross. And their belief is, is that Christ has taken care of the suffering aspect of it. There's, there's really not a notion that, in, in many of them, that, that your job is, oddly enough, to unite yourself to Christ's sufferings as a part of the church universal to bring about redemption. That is, you're in co-suffering, you're co-redemptive. Now, of course, completely by grace, you have to right. remember that, but what it means is it gives a value to suffering that doesn't make it any less suffering. It's not like, oh, well, now it's not painful. Uh, it, it's horribly painful in the same way the cross was painful, but it's no longer meaningless. And so that focus on the crucifix is essentially Catholic. I mean, you, uh, uh, and, and it doesn't, as far as I'm, really play a part in Methodism at all. Yeah. Yeah, that, I know that when I was a Protestant for 40 years and a pastor for 10 of those, that um, I didn't have a clear answer to suffering anyway. Mm. I mean, whether it was redemptive or not, never crossed my mind. But just understanding um, that old question, why does a good God allow suffering. I did not have a clear understanding of that. Part of it was also that because of Protestants, we often looked on justification as an external application over a sinner mm -hmm. in the sense that I am not really changed. I'm covered by the righteousness of Christ. So a suffering could be seen as a residual of that which is underneath breaking through, the reality of who I am on this side, uh, but that the fact that I could somehow offer up that little phrase, Offer it up, <laughs> which sadly so many Catholics today take for granted. But it's deep theology. It is. The it offering is. up, as Paul says in Colossians 1.24, one of those verses that we avoid when we are Protestants, that somehow our suffering completes yeah. what is lacking. I don't know that we've helped you with the easy words. I will tell you, if you want a good study, let's look at John Paul II's encyclical on suffering. Mm. Uh, John Paul's life. What was that? Redemptus uh, salvific 
the chorus, something like that. We'll look up the Latin. Yeah, later. look it up and go to <laughs> EWTN's catalog. You can yeah. download the whole thing. It's a tremendous study of Colossians 124. You Protestants that are watching, that wonder about suffering, wonder what Paul meant by Colossians 124, look at John Paul's writing on that. It's a Bible study on the understanding of suffering. Let's go down to Norma from Indiana. Hello, what's your question for us? Yes, sir. Did you fight within yourself to become a Catholic, and did you have a hard time talking about it to other people? Thanks, Norma. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, for a long time, I didn't know I was fighting not to be a Catholic. I think that God happily veiled it from me, and so uh, what I was doing was uh, trying to figure out what is true. It, in whatever area I was in, I was passionately concerned to find out what is true. And so uh, you, you approach this already with the presumption that truth wasn't relative. Uh, yeah, uh, once I was immersed in, uh, I had a very good teacher uh, who was uh, 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 taught by uh, one of the eminent political philosophers of the 20th century, Leo Strauss, and uh, he brought me into these great philosophical texts. Once I saw truth, and this is a very Catholic thing to do, wherever there is truth, you're ultimately going to be led to God. It doesn't matter if it's a pagan philosopher, where it is. Uh, I just became inflamed by this desire to find out what was true, and I had seen it. You know, you get that glimmer. Um, and then it was slowly unveiled, well, you're coming into the church. Okay, so I'm, I, I might have gone in through Plato's Republic or Aristotle's Nicomachean <laughs> Ethics, but it was always a door to the cathedral, mm. uh, which, is, which is the church. Yes. So I, 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 there was at the end, I remember thinking, oh, because you think of all the church teachings that you think, oh, well, I don't really want to do that. But at that point, both my wife and I were, okay, we're tired of the cafeteria stuff. We don't care how bad it is. We're going to swallow the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I want to remind you that we, uh, the phone numbers, if you'd like to call us with a question, are 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. And let's see, I think we might have an email here. Let's see what we're going to get posted here. I know I've seen a few here. This comes from Randy in Kentucky. How did you tell your friends and family your decision to become Catholic? <laughs> and how did they take it? <laughs> um, I think they tried to be polite. That is, both family thought, it, uh, you know, that it was a little like joining the circus or, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be world famous mimes or some strange thing. It was just weird as if we were going to join a cult and they, they wished us well. They didn't impede us, <laughs> but I don't think they understood it. That is, it was a weird decision uh, in far as family. And then people around us, some, of course, the Methodists, w whom we knew, were shocked. I remember looking, seeing the, our Methodist minister. He was across the street, and he saw us after he had heard them, and, and he looked away. And I thought, what should I do? Should I go? I never went and talked to him. I, I don't know whether I should have done something or not. But, uh, <laughs> you know, our, but our friends did politely deal with us, but they did not understand it. Yep. Yeah. Well, I know that well, that, yes. whole, that whole process. Let's see, we've got another email here. looks like they're just fine-tuning a little bit. This comes from Marcia in Kentucky. Hi, Marcus and Dr. Weicker. Could you recommend a book for my sister and her husband, who is an associate pastor at a Bible church? I've been praying for their conversion, and some surprising things have happened in their lives. When people who once thought the Catholic Church was a part of a cult start faithfully watching Fulton Sheen on EWTN, you know something's up. <laughs> what subtle book could I send them this Christmas? <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, that, you know, I, I don't because it seems to me that there's a particular call in regard to conversion. And when you, I, it's, it's hard to discern what the nature of the soul is you are dealing with. You probably know best, yeah. but it's hard, it's hard to be a doctor long distance because you don't know what the particular obstacles are. That's what would keep me from making a recommendation. I know. And I, I've got to address this, too, because I get this all the time, questions on emails on this. And part of the reason is, is that I know on, on our program we mention books all the time, books yeah. that shaped your life and shaped yeah. mine. And, um, but you know what's also amazing is conversion happens by grace. 
And God can use some of the weirdest things. Absolutely. I mean, I Absolutely. know people who've been converted by things that now they would never recommend that anybody ever read. <laughs> Should be burned even. <laughs> right, because it was like you were saying, some of the stuff you studied you wouldn't necessarily want the audience to read, but God used that Absolutely, yeah. to help you yeah. see the craziness of that. Yeah. So, yeah. so part of it is recognizing that wherever your friends are, you be praying for them. Because God can use that, even if they're in, up to here in the muck, God can somehow use that to awaken them to his reality. On the other hand, you know them better than we do. Absolutely, yeah. You know what kind of books they like, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, whether they like history, politics, uh, mystery books. What is it that they like? There are books out there, especially in EWTN Religious Catalog, or you go to chnetwork.org and look at our catalog of stuff. But there are lots of good books that have been selected with different goals in mind. And my encouragement to everyone who wants the name of a book is you find a book you think both you and they would be interested in, but you read it first. So then you know, one, whether you think it's good, and number two, whether you think they would like it. And then you give it to them as a gift with prayer. God can use it anyway. Even if it doesn't have to be the one that's going to be, God can use it. And there's a, we, We've never lived at a time in the history of this world when more resources have been this readily available. It's it an is, amazing time. It is true, and I, I don't know, I'm just going to, to throw myself off the cliff here and, and make this suggestion. Uh, one of the things that I think should be attractive about the Catholic Church is all the weirdness that uh, they didn't tell me about when I converted. They didn't tell me that, <laughs> they didn't tell me about the incorruptibles, they didn't tell me about Eucharistic miracles, they didn't tell me about Padre Pio. You know, but why not make these things known? Yeah. Uh, the, the presence of the miraculous can't help but yeah. stun people who don't think miracles occur. Remember, that's what Jesus did. He did miracles to make us aware of his divinity. Yeah. And the presence of the miraculous can make uh, 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 others who are not in the church aware that there must be something here. People don't just ordinarily bleed from the hands for 50 years. Something is up here. And then if you read about his life and you see the holiness, somebody like Padre Pio, or you read, for example, uh, 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 Sister Faustina, The Divine Mercy, you know, uh, I, th those books I, f I now find overwhelming. And I would not have read them, yeah. uh, you know, 20 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm having a 50s moment right now, but <laughs> help me on this. The, the Jewish atheist from World War II, the sister who read St. Therese's story of a soul and converted because of it. Oh, Teresa Benedicta, uh, Edith Stein. Edith Stein. I mean, there in itself is an example. No one in Edith Stein's life would have ever dreamed yeah. of giving her that book. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. But God used the miraculous to turn her mm -hmm. into a saint. So there's all kinds of great books out there. In some sense, your prayers are more important. Your love for that person is the most. And then find that book that God is leading you. And again, the religious catalog, that's why it's there this time of year as you're getting ready for Christmas. Yeah. Great books on the catalog. Pray for guidance, pick that book, read it yourself, and then give it in prayer. And just wait and see what God can do. Let's take our next email, uh, Diane in Cleveland, Ohio. I fell upon your program channel surfing and was interested as my daughter is converting to Catholicism from Southern Baptist. Oh, wow, glad God led you to our program. I don't have a problem with it, but do have several questions. Catholics seem to put a lot of emphasis on, quote, rote prayers, which are constantly repeated, i.e. the rosary, when the Bible speaks against, quote, vain repetition. Also, prayers made to Mary and the saints in confession to a priest when Jesus is our high priest, our stumbling blocks to her. Thanks, Diane, for your email. A couple of quick questions there. You can be able to deal with oh, them in a second here. Okay, uh, yes. <laughs> well, rote prayers. Okay, uh, here's how I um, deal with that. When you were small, smaller, uh, how did you learn your multiplication tables? That is, how did you learn your ABCs? How do you learn things uh, when you are, as it were, trying to set the foundation for something and you do it by that kind of prayer, that kind of repetition. So you can see that that kind of prayer has some kind of merit. Yep. Why would you read, say, you wouldn't say about the New Testament, gosh, I read that one before, you know, I don't really need to go back. What you mean is this is worthy of a lifetime of reflection. Well, 
if the rosary itself is simply a mirror of, of the New Testament, which it is, what it's trying to get you to understand is there is a lifetime of reflection in the smallest words, that is, the shortest speeches um, and aspects of the New Testament are, are, are worthy of a lifetime of reflection. So the focus isn't on the roteness, it's on the meditation. Yeah. So in other words, what you have here is a fathomless depth of truth. And, what is, and, and the reason you come back to it is that you can never fully uh, plumb those depths. So you're not just biding time. Now, of course, we all yeah. fuzz out when we're trying to say the rosary. It's very <laughs> difficult, but that's because of our own defects, not because of the defects of the prayer. Yeah. And the rosary is quoting scripture. Yeah. And the other thing, I remember when I was a Protestant minister, there was a, a quote from John the Baptist that I would often repeat, um, even had it on my pulpit. And it was, he must increase, I must decrease. And that was John the Baptist's prayer, mm -hmm. in essence. And so, but it, it's a wonderful prayer because I couldn't say it any better. Yes. He must yeah. increase. I must decrease. Well, if I can say, no, I can't say that again. I've got to be creative. Well, he said it better than I can. And that is the beauty of the prayers that we've preserved in the church. These prayers were put together like, like Thomas Aquinas' great prayer for after receiving the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. these are great minds, uh, great wisdom, understand theology. Uh, why do we say the creed? because of the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to put it exactly correctly. Mm -hmm. If we have a drive to be creative every time, we can end up saying some things that aren't correct. Um, of course, the other thing is, and Tom Howard says this well in his book, uh, Evangelical is Not Enough, he says, even those that want to be completely, don't want to say anything wrote, anything, want, the reality is that even um, impromptu prayer always has things like, I just really, Jesus, want to love you. Please, Jesus. I mean, you're repeating the same phrases over and over again. Yeah, the, uh, the, the desire merely to be creative. There's not, I guess you should understand this. Also, there's nothing wrong. There's everything right with simply praying what you want to say right. to God. The, the right. Catholic Church isn't saying, you shall pray the rosary and neither never pray anything else. You, you can you can always and should always pray from your heart about whatever is uh, is on your heart. But at the same time, you'll find if you really pray deeply the Rosary or the Our uh, just the Our Father or the Glory Be, you know that really is what's on your heart. You don't know it yet, but that really is what's there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's take a break, and we'll come back in a moment with some of your questions for Ben. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Dr. Ben Weicker. He's a former guest on the program, author of a number of books. His most recent one is A Meaningful World, How the Arts and Sciences Reveal the Genius of Nature. And I think soon you'll be able to get that on your religious catalog if it isn't already there. But uh, a good book for those uh, who are struggled with the issues of science and religion. Mm. And uh, can you be a good scientist and have faith and vice versa. And uh, we might get some more phone calls on that. We do have a call now from Tom, South Carolina. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Uh, my question is, I have a father that's a Southern Baptist, and I'm a new convert to the faith. Oh, welcome home. Thank you. And uh, what I'm trying to do is be able to talk to him and defend the faith and let him understand why I'm, I've chosen the path I've chosen and I uh, would like him to choose the same path too, but yeah. it's really hard to get you know, to change someone who's been a Southern Baptist for 70 years. Yeah, boy, that's, well, first of all, I'm gonna ask everybody watching, praying for you, because that's uh, uh, a, a difficult issue. I know from personal experience. 
Um, you know, my mother finally came into the church, but other than that, no one on either my wife Marilyn's side of the family or my side has come into the church. Uh, people watch my show every week. You know, it never seems to make a dent. You know, and <laughs> so uh, you know, what's your thoughts on how he can help uh, reach out to his uh, Baptist father? I think it was Baptist. Yeah, I, I would say um, don't don't be a um, a, a uh, frontline apologist. By that I mean like frontline in football that you're ramming into them. <laughs> we all make that. I made that mistake. Heaven, you know, we all make it. We're we're out to uh, to knock down uh, people for the faith like bowling pins. The thing that always works is the holiness of our own lives. It's the hardest thing. If you lead with holiness, everything else will follow. That is, they'll want to know mm. why you converted then they won't be caught on the defensive they'll be coming to you so if they see a transformation in you uh that's going to be attractive just y your very person so uh, and that's that's the that's the bad news of the good news is you you're com you have to that's your first apologetic offensive move is not to be offensive that is is to be attractive you know charity never repels uh, and we always remember your own conversion, that is, if somebody rammed into you from the side or the front, uh, hitting directly against something rather than uh, attracting you through the truth and through their own charity, uh, you may not have converted. I mean, who, who knows? I don't know your personal story, but that would have been uh, for often, it's what turns people off rather than on. Uh, this is going to sound just for a moment like an infomercial, and I don't mean it to sound that way, but <laughs> it's a talk I give once in a while. And I have you can go to chnetwork.org and and uh, maybe order a copy or ask them for a copy. But I give a list of the 16 barriers to conversion, the 16 things that, in general, I'm trying to summarize all the things that stand in the way. And I know on this program I've often said that it seems that the top three, and I'm thinking of your call that we just got, the top three reasons seems to be the top three why people aren't Catholic. And for want of better words, ignorance, prejudice, and bad Catholics. <laughs> I mean, the ignorance is not a bad thing. It's not like stupidity. It's that they don't have the data. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right? I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. you look back on your own journey. Wow. You'd never learned the data. No one ever told you. You had not read the book. You hadn't been to the RCIA yet. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know. That, you just didn't know. Prejudice, what you think you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. The things you were told about the faith are not true. And especially if you've got a Baptist father, I'm sure he's heard a few things about the Catholic Church that are not true at all. They've just been passed mm -hmm. along without people examining whether they're true or not. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is bad Catholics, and that is that sometimes we don't give a good model for our faith. Yeah, I, 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 and I've failed so many times here. I, 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 this is a, a bad night for confession for me, but the, you know, you always <laughs> no one else listening. No one else listening. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a personal thing. I'm <laughs> sure everyone will turn away while we say this. But, you know, we get we get. Uh, 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 I guess they're uh, what Mormons or whatever uh, uh, coming to our door, and I used to get so angry at them, and you know, and, and say you know, just brush them off, and 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 then I realized to finally, okay, what is their picture of the Catholic Church? Well, they just got it from me. Okay, so. <laughs> And how many more years in purgatory do I get for that? You know, you realize that if you aren't showing yourself in a Christ-like way, well, then you're not mirroring the church. Yeah. You know, uh, you're not cheering for a football team. You're trying to, uh, uh, to, to manifest w the truth of the church in your own life. And that, that's what makes it so yeah. difficult. Yeah. So difficult. So my reason for sharing those with that is that, number one, think about your father. There's things about the faith he just doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe invincibly, he just hasn't been told. Number two, there's some things that prayerfully we've got to straighten up, clear up. And three, as you said earlier, he's got to, his son's got to live the faith and just help his father say, you know, I want what you've got. I mean, that's our goal. Yeah, yeah that would be it, yeah. That's our goal. Uh, let's go with um, Chris, an email from Chris in Summit, New Jersey. I'm a Southern Baptist and have spent much time in prayer considering the Roman Catholic Church. One difficult for me is the uh, Roman Catholic belief in the perpetual virginity and sinless life of Mary. Even if one accepts her immaculate conception, once she bore Jesus, there seems to be no theological reason or biblical support of either condition, her perpetual virginity or her sinless life. Can you explain the origins of such belief? Thanks, Chris, for the email. <laughs> Dr. Well, Weicker. Not, <laughs> not, not in a small way. 
Uh, well, certainly, what uh, many people become convinced by by going back uh, to the earliest church uh, fathers and seeing how long ago this was believed. That is, uh, you've already. It sounds like understand enough about the need for a sinless origin of Jesus to accept the front part of the doctrine. Yeah. Um, there are several things that can help you say, well, gosh, uh, if, if it started out that way, if Mary had to be somehow sinless to begin with because Christ could not be born in someone, literally, with original sin, um, what necessity is that for, for that to continue? Um, uh, you know, then, then you have to, to look at s s various things. You say, well, wait a second. Jesus really took his flesh from his mother. When I f realized, I thought it was my wife that said that to me, and it just, whoa, I, I couldn't, <laughs> I think, oh, that's got to be right. And, and you say, well, could it ever be touched then by anything corrupt? You know, this is an extraordinary thought. You know, this man looked like her. We would have to, right? I mean, you wouldn't have any doubt about whose mother that was. Yeah. Uh, and so you're saying, well, um, wouldn't it be the same God who could s could provide a an immaculate beginning uh, could, through grace, preserve her? Yeah. You know, in other, in other words, you have to say, well, why wouldn't he do that? If we argue that it's by grace, um, are you arguing that it's not possible for God to do that? Or, or are you arguing that you know for a fact that it didn't happen? And so if God has the power to do that, there doesn't seem to be any reason why he, why he wouldn't. You know, there's a... Um I mean, what is the problem with imagining that by gr being full of grace, Mary was therefore empowered to resist temptation? I mean, that's basically it. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we fail? We think about it. Most of us know better when we do things wrong. We know better, right? But we fail. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the difference between knowing better? What, what happens between that we know better and then we mess up? Well, we've had a temptation, a situation, and then we, we failed. Our conscience didn't, and our will didn't con give us the strength. Well, the difference between Mary and us is that she, had, she was full of grace. She had the grace that we have in little bits. The only reason that you or I can resist temptation at all is because of grace. Mm -hmm. Well, she was full of grace. And as I've heard, I don't know who it was Fulton Sheen or who has said, you know, what part of full of grace don't you understand? You know, I mean, I forget who said that because it's a great way. How, how full is full? I mean, it's full. That is the foundation for understanding of her ability by Christ to remain sinless. Mm. So that's approaching it not from the direction of her necessity to be that way, but because she was empowered to be that way mm. from Christ. It wasn't Mary per se. It was Christ that empowered her to do that. Let's see, we got another email. Uh, hi, I, hello, I am Gilberto from Brazil, South America. Welcome, I'm glad you're watching the show. Uh, via the internet, great. How was the pro-life movement treated in the other Christian denominations? Thanks, Gilberto. Well, and Gilberto, I want you to go to the chnetwork.org website because we now have a new Hispanic uh, website. I know you speak Portuguese in Brazil, but uh, I want to announce that to go to that website, chnetwork.org, we have an entire side for Hispanic speakers uh, we'd like to get connected with. And we can talk about that very, very issue on the website. How is the pro-life movement treated in other Christian denominations? That, that's messy because <laughs> uh, there, uh, there weren't any sure guidelines followed when abortion came up as a serious issue in the 20th century. Prior to the 20th century, all, all abortion has been around since yeah. ancient Egypt times. That wasn't in Egyptian times, it wasn't invented. So you can say this for certain, that through up through the beginning, or even to the middle of the 1900s, all Christians were against abortion. In fact, up to the beginning of the 1900s, all of them were against contraception. However, uh, many of the denominations, almost all of them, many of the denominations do not have a, a, a locus of authority which gives a, any kind of a clear teaching. 
And so what has happened in the 20th century under pressure of uh, secularization is they simply dissolved. Mm -hmm. They don't have any coherent positions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and mainstream denominations only seem to put forth incoherent positions. Yeah. You know, so you, 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 you can't find any coherent argument against it. The, the good news about that is that uh, on the front lines uh, uh, against abortion, you find that uh, there are a lot of attraction to Catholics who can articulate the position and show how it fits theologically into the larger framework, and uh, the Protestants who realize there's something wrong with abortion. Yeah. They are very attracted to the faith. I think there's a lot of conversions that occur outside of abortion mills, Protestant to Catholic, yeah. because of that. Well, having been a pro-life Presbyterian, um, my wife and I both were involved with the pro-life movement as Presbyterians mm -hmm. in a basically pro-choice denomination. Mm -hmm. That the one positive thing to say uh, to you uh, from South America is that in every Protestant denomination that I know of, there are pro-life movements within it. Mm -hmm. They're often small, <coughs> fighting uphill against you know, the, the trend and the, and the rest. And basically, I would say that the foundational argument is because these groups are generally uh, deeply committed evangelicals at heart. Number two, they believe in the infallibility of Scripture. And so through the reading of Scripture, they recognize that there is no accidental birth, no accidental conception, that God knows us from the creation. So if he knows that, that becomes the foundation, mm -hmm. then there's got to be something wrong. You put that together with it's, it's a sin to kill, and so you know that these are human beings. And so you can find more individual groups, individual Christians in all Christian denominations that are drawn to the pro-life platform. And praise God for that. Yeah. Praise God for that. And we need to pray for them because they are under attack, because mm -hmm. they aren't supported from the top. Mm -hmm. of their denomination. That's right. And often they get their support from Catholics in the Catholic Church that will stand with them. And we'll be seeing that soon in January when we're all marching on Washington no. pretty soon. All right, let's see. Let's go to a phone call. Edward from New Jersey. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding a person that's married to you. I'm a Catholic and my wife is Jewish. And uh, we've been married 50 years, and wow. uh, we have never uh, come to any understanding of uh, the religion. I'm more religious than she is. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any advice, any any anything that uh, we could read, or uh, wow. uh, that you might you seem to know a lot about religion that might be uh, more interesting and and better for us to understand. Well, first of all, thank you for watching the program. God bless you and your wife, 50 years. Uh, Excellent. Uh, I mean, that's a witness in itself, and our prayers are with you on that. Any thoughts, uh, first of all, from you? Well, I, I, you know, the thing that pops into my head is that uh, certainly you, the, probably the most important thing you can understand is the Jewish roots of Catholicism. Yeah. I mean, when you read through the Old Testament, uh, and really em embrace what it's trying to tell us about covenants, since uh, you you and your wife are in a, this wonderful covenant called marriage. Uh, um, w all the things that are in the Old Testament are taken up into the church, uh, and and so if you see that in a way, say, could you become more Jewish because that'll make you more Catholic? You know, mm -hmm. if you recover those roots. Uh, you can you can really understand why the Catholic Church is in continuity in regard to revelation, in regard to the priesthood, in regard to the sacrifice. Um, so it, it may be, rather than trying to draw her away from Judaism, maybe you should go deeper into it to understand how the you Church... appreciate your own Catholicism yeah. in the process, learning each other's faith. Um, I'm sorry that I can't right now remember the name of this book by Rhonda Shervin, my guess is it's on the religious catalog, but she has a book in which she has, I think, 10 or so stories of Jewish converts to the Catholic faith, and those stories give their reasons for becoming Catholic. And there's a book I would recommend for Christmas for you to read first, and then as you read it, you'll discern whether it's something that uh, you would find is a good book for your wife. 
Uh, and I'm, again, I'm going to ask everyone watching to pray for you, for the two of you, uh, because it's got to have a difficult time to want to both live out your faith uh, for so many years. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Robert. Hello, Robert. Where are you calling from? What's your question? Oh, I'm from Maine. And my question is, well, first of all, Benjamin is an excellent name parents chose for you. <laughs> At any rate, Benjamin, what did it feel like the first time you received the body of our Lord? I, I was scared stiff that I, would, <laughs> that I would do something awful. You know, it was, it was absolutely frightening because we had, you know, gone through something like nine months you know, being prepared and for this great moment, and I was, we were, I, at least, I, well, I think my wife was too. We were so nervous that I think it took several times to get quiet down enough uh, because of the momentousness to to. Could I say this? Really enjoy it, <laughs> you know. But it's, uh, um, it, it was, it's, it was an amazing thing, obviously, and a kind of a scary thing if you think about what you're really doing. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's what drew us both into the faith, and it was it was the culmination of our conversion. That that's definitely true. You know, I was thinking about that. One of the reasons that the Protestant reformers rejected the Catholic view of transubstantiation was to to move away from the philosophical descriptions of transubstantiation, substance and yeah, accidents, yeah, yeah. to get away from that. And part of it is now we have a culture that doesn't study philosophy, so the, if you mention substance and accidents, they haven't got a clue. They haven't got a clue, yeah. yeah. But for someone that studied that and really understands the significance of substance and accidents and what something really is versus what it looks like, did that make it easier for you? I think it was. It was part. I, I realized that the Eucharist was the ultimate affirmation of reality, and interestingly enough, uh, again, all of the philosophical wrongheadedness I saw in the early Enlightenment, and here I'm talking about you know, even 1600s and 1700s, was anti-sacramental. In other words, I saw everybody he who was heading in the wrong direction uh, as being anti-sacramental, and so as it were, moving backwards from that, realizing, well, the Eucharist is the one thing that keeps you tethered to reality. You know, it demands that you take reality seriously. It, de it allows uh, the presence of Christ to be always with us hmm. rather than back there. You know, that's one, I would say, can I say this, annoying thing about Protestantism, and I don't mean that, but it must be annoy them is that they have to go back they, in a way, have to recover Jesus through the text, the Bible. Okay. Whereas, you know, no, 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 he's here. Yes, he's in the Bible, but you don't have to go back to a moment. You don't have to go back there for your miracles. We've got him right in front of you. <laughs> you know, it's all here for us. Let's say for a second that we have watching the program an atheist or someone that's caught up in scientific materialism, mm -hmm. someone that's left the church, left the faith behind. What would you say as an encouragement to them? Uh, where are they to start, well, to uh, start returning to faith in God and Jesus Christ and the church? Yeah, and that, this is another example of the, and the right thing being said at the right time. If you, come, if you cut straight to the quick with somebody who's not ready for it, you're wasting your time. You know, they're not ready to do that. And, and God is merciful and extremely patient in his providence, I can attest from personal experience, <laughs> he pushes, but not you know not overly hard. But the the with somebody like that, that's w one of the reasons that we wrote the uh, uh, a meaningful uh, world because we want to show you that you know say you you uh, you scientific person uh, who accepts the tenets of modern science that actually the latest science is leading you away from atheism, and the reason is this. The attempt to approach reality as if it was merely made by chance, it was merely material, proved, disproved <laughs> atheism by trying to prove it. The most recent science turns the other way, mm -hmm. turns you toward uh, what we would call a natural theology. That is, yes, you can know God exists from nature. And that's the right starting point for somebody like that. Oh, well, if I can believe that, then I can believe 
all this other stuff. That's mm. the stepping stone. But you've got to get, you have to get bad science replaced by good science, and that's hopefully what we're trying to do with this book. I remember a guest on my show who was an atheist, and the thing that that started him back, the first step was realizing that two plus two does equal four. That's a good place to start. There's reality. <laughs> There's something that's true. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dr. Weicker, great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ben. It's good to have you here. Thank you for your witness and your writing. It's encouragement to us. And uh, thank you for joining us on the journey home. Hope it's been an encouragement to you. And uh, God bless you. Be with you again next week. Thank you.